All right. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. Um, we're very lucky in that we're able to bring out some, uh, some extremely talented and experienced people to this festival every year. Um, and this year, we have a very interesting person with a very interesting, uh, very interesting resume. John Cabrera, who's our jury president, I don't know how we managed to talk him into doing all these things. He's, he's uh, practically running the festival for us. <laughs> he's a keynote speaker, he's the president of the jury, and he ran a workshop with us today. So uh, he's, he's got a very busy time while he's here in Melbourne in between, um, you know, uh, bar hopping and, and late night ramen eating. Um, <laughs> But uh, to say a little bit about John, he has worked for over a decade as a writer, producer and director and actor uh, at the uh, studio level in Hollywood and he's worked across a, a range of newly renovated and brand areas uh, of the entertainment industry. He was a member of the supporting cast for a, one of my favourite comedy series, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Yes, how good is it? And uh, also, um, Gilmore Girls, as you know. And there were quite a few journalists who met John here uh, earlier in the week who wanted to, uh, who were fishing for plot points and uh, what's about to come when it returns to Netflix. But it's just, you know, talk to him about other things because you're getting nowhere. I've tried. Um, <coughs> so, um, leaving the career as an actor, he moved on to writing and, and uh, notably he co-created the award-winning uh, series H+, the digital series, which was uh, developed at Warner Brothers. And I think at the time it was also the biggest budget that was ever uh, attached to a web series. That series was produced under the guidance of Brian Singer, who we all know is the director and producer of the X-Men franchise, so John is keeping good company. And um, since then, he's worked with a variety of studios and media companies under his, uh, his own brand, Unboiled, developing projects for traditional mediums as well as digital. So please welcome to the stage our keynote speaker for tonight, John Cabrera, fast track from the US. I'm, I'm going to do this a little different. I'm going to stand out front here. You guys know everybody's reading these things, so you'll, you know, you'll cut me some slack uh, with this, uh, this iPhone. Um, thank you, Steiner, for the wonderful introduction and for the late night ramen and, uh, and all of the drinking. I'm hoping that there's going to be more of that. Uh, so yeah, um, I didn't realize that I was going to be getting the, the introduction with all of the credits uh, and whatnot, um, so I was going to tell you a little bit about myself uh, to sort of start. I don't need to. Uh, he's given you all of that. So I'll just kind of dive in. Um, yeah, most of you, I'm guessing, are creators, web series creators, digital creators, filmmakers, I'm guessing. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a question, start this out with a question. What, uh, what do you think makes content successful? It's a big question, right? Uh, in the digital age, we've got views, we've got shares. Of course, the big one is whether it's going to make any money, right? So what, what actually, success, that's kind of a big one. Maybe we'll hold off on that. Let's instead, let's uh, ask another question that kind of going off of that. Um, what makes content valuable? How does the web series industry become profitable? Um, I created H Plus in 2012. As Steiner said, it was the biggest uh, budgeted web series at that time, $2 million budget. Uh, and if there's one question that I've gotten more than any other, uh, it was, yeah, oh, I mean, it looked amazing. I mean, incredible. But how is it going to make its money back? And I guess if we're going to be honest, it didn't make its money back. Um, so what makes it valuable? What makes any content monetarily valuable, right? If successful uh, is, you know, profit, the ability to continue making more, uh, if that's the measurement of success. Well, I have a thought on that. 
which is probably gonna sound a little pessimistic, actually, uh, just to warn you, um, but I promise if you stay with me, there is some good news. Um, your content isn't really worth very much, actually. It's worth practically nothing, um, monetarily. I mean, emotionally, sentimentally, yeah, it's, it's worth something, but as a product, hmm worth very, very little. Um, that's not to say that you can't find a buyer, um, you know, that there isn't a network out there that, you know, has money that wants to license it or even buy it, right? It just means that they're buying something that's not really worth much. I mean, Warner Brothers did license the, the content to YouTube, so I guess that they did make a little bit of money, and they might license or sell it to somebody else, and that company might sell it to somebody else. Eventually, somebody is going to own it, and they're going to realize that they're just sitting on something that is just not worth much at all, um, especially if things keep kind of going the way that they are, right, with, you know, ever-increasing amounts of content available to us. The counselor actually mentioned that, you know, we, we live in this age where, like, Netflix, you know, is giving you so much content for the price that you s used to spend on, you know, a couple of DVDs, right? It's kind of like aluminum. You guys know the story of aluminum, right? That aluminum used to be worth more than gold, right? Because at one time, it was very difficult to collect aluminum. And then one day, the tools uh, were developed that made it very, very easy, just like all these new digital tools that have democratized content creation, right? And it turns out there is a lot of aluminum out there to collect, just like there's lots of ideas out there to bring to life. And so it's not really worth much anymore, right? That's just simple economics. I know that that's probably not what you guys wanted to hear, right? Like you guys are web creators. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> I, sp <laughs> I spent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in our case, millions of dollars on content, and it's not worth anything? And so why am I doing this again? Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself, a little further past what Steiner uh, brought up. We're going to go a little further back um, because... I think it'll give you a better understanding of why I think this way. Um, I was partially raised by television. I, I, I didn't say raised on television. I said raised by television. I think that they're very different. Um, I was a latchkey kid. My mother uh, was a single parent who worked crazy long hours to provide for us, put food on the table, you know, roof over the head, all that good stuff. Um, when I was about 13 years old, my uh, sister, my only sibling, uh, she moved to a dance conservatory about 40 minutes away to pursue ballet, um, which meant that I came home every day to an empty house, a freezer, you know, just packed with frozen dinners, um, and TVs in every room of the house. And the moment that I stepped inside that house, I turned on every single one of them, all to a different channel, and I cranked up the volume as loud as, as I could. And as I'm sure you can imagine, I can, you know, still to this day, if I hear an 80s jingle, I can just sing along with it, you know. Um, I, uh, I, you know, could imitate every actor on TV. I performed my own scenes with myself in the mirror. Uh, my family dinners were with the cast of Cheers and different strokes. Um, I did my homework uh, to David Hasselhoff's Knight Rider looking over my shoulder. Um, that entire house was a cacophony of sound from uh, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon to about 11 o'clock at night. Um, in fact, if you were placed in the middle of that house with your eyes closed, you would have no idea that there was just one kid in there. And that's because, in a sense, there wasn't. I turned on all those televisions for one reason, one reason only so that I wouldn't feel so alone, right? Instinct. I know it might sound like a depressing image, but it really wasn't. Um, I was part of something totally natural, totally human, that actually had very little to do with television. Um, and the proof of that came when I got to high school, and I found, found that all the, that weird uh, imitation, all those skills that I had developed actually made me kind of perfect for the drama club. Um, I, uh, I don't know if I'd say it was overnight, but pretty soon I went from imitating TV shows in the mirror to doing plays at my high school and becoming addicted to the energy between me and my fellow cast and, of course, the audience, which actually felt, you know, felt quite similar to all of those years in that house with all those TVs turned on. I wore my drama dork badge with pride. I hung out exclusively with the other dorks. You know, we dreamed up projects together, we rehearsed our scenes after school, 
Eventually, I, uh, I applied and got accepted to an acting conservatory in Chicago where I engaged in you know, much of the same. And I stopped watching television completely. Not a single second of TV through the entire 90s. I'm serious, not a second of it. For example, I completely missed the show Friends, right? I mean, I, 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 mean, I didn't need it, right? I had my, my own friends, right? That kid back in the 80s, that kid in that house, well, I mean, he would have loved Friends, right? But in the 90s, my friends and I, we were thinking about art, right? That's all we were focused on, right? We wanted to create the greatest pieces of theater the world had ever known. And this is around the time when I first started asking myself that big question, right? What makes content successful? Of course, at that time, you know, it was what makes a play successful. And of course, the obvious answer was, it's got to be good, right? Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's got to be great, right? The acting has got to be absolutely perfect. The script, insightful, a unique blend of pathos and humor, right? There was a formula for greatness. I was convinced of it, and I was determined to figure it out. And that dominated most of my focus there in Chicago. Um, and I was lucky. I, I was able to work with some amazing theater companies. I got to be a part of some really well-made pieces of theater and, you know, buying for awards, trying to get those glowing reviews. And yet, that formula for greatness continued to elude me. The only thing that I seemed to figure out definitively was how frickin' poor you become trying to actually answer that question. Um, and so, like a lot, of, a lot of artists in these art community cities, uh, I eventually decided to move to Los Angeles. Of course I did, right? And of course, after eight years uh, in Chicago, trudging through the art scene, building a theater company, acting in plays for practically nothing, within a year and a half of being in Los Angeles, I was cast on a television show. I was cast on Gilmore Girls. Um, and it was as if the city was saying, ha, let me see you go back to your little art projects now, right? I gotcha. Of course, you know, I wasn't going to be, uh, you know, so easily swayed. In fact, I somehow had this image that I would get to L.A. and I would solve that art riddle there too. And after getting, you know, that television role on, you know, on Gilmore Girls, I was the most financially flexible that I'd been in my entire life. So I was convinced that I would finally be able to do it, right? Because I had, I had resources. Except, of course, L.A. is, you know, the city of film, not the city of theater. So it was all about art through film. So I spent almost every dime that I made on that show buying cameras, buying lighting, buying, you know, editing software, teaching myself how to edit, how to do VFX in my room, writing my own shorts, learning how to, you know, just basically do everything, right? I consumed all the great works of film. I had my finger on the pulse of the festival circuit, wondering, you know, what was it that the films in selection were actually doing right, you know? What could I do to, you know, get my film into a festival? Putting myself in, you know, my own little film school, trying to answer that question, trying to find that formula for greatness, you know, since that's the measure of success, right? And I still wasn't watching television. I had no clue what was going on in TV. I mean, everybody back then knew, you know, if you're looking for greatness in art, you certainly don't want to be looking at television, right? Um, I mean, I, and I have to be honest with you, I mean, this might you know, it might hurt some of the Gilmore Girls fans out there, but I, I wasn't even really watching the show that I was on all that much, right? I mean, I didn't have any time. I was out there trying to create something, right? Something great. And then I guess uh, it was around 2006, um, well over a decade after I'd begun this quest for great art, right? Um, after two short films, an arty music video that, that I did for a singer-songwriter, uh, that I just burned out, you know, trying to solve that stupid puzzle. I mean, yeah, I got into some festivals, and I got rejected from some festivals, and some people liked some of the stuff that I was doing, and some people didn't like some of the stuff that I was doing. And I really just didn't know anymore why I should even be doing this. And I pretty much just stopped creating altogether. I didn't create for, like, almost two years. Um, and I was, I guess you could say I was kind of lost, 
Which makes it very serendipitous that it was around this time that the television show Lost came into my uh, sphere of consciousness. Um, it was about 2006. Uh, the show had been on the air for about three years. I remember hearing all the hype about it, and you know, I wanted to you know, see what everybody was talking about, so I turned on an episode, and uh, I had no idea what was going on. There was some, a guy like getting chased by a boar, and I was just like, this is horrendous. You know, I turned it off. You know, I realized, like, okay, this is the reason why you haven't been watching television for the past decade. It's terrible. Um, and I didn't think much more about it. And then one day, I went to a little gathering at a friend's place, um, which turned out to be a lost viewing party. Um, again, just a random episode. I had no idea what was going on. Um, I thought the script was pretty cheesy. The acting was pretty cheesy. Um, but everybody was having such a good time, you know? Uh, and so I thought, okay, well, you know what, maybe, maybe I gotta give this show another chance. Maybe I gotta start from, maybe, that's the idea, maybe I gotta start from the beginning and watch the pilot, and maybe there's something there. So I did. And I freaking loved it. I absolutely loved that show. Uh, I, you know, was suddenly obsessed with like, who's who, what's the landscape of the island? I started theorizing all kinds of stuff, started talking to my friends, like, what do you think's going on there? You know, all this stuff, uh, asking questions, you know, I got so into that show, I kid you not, I started blogging about that show. Seriously, I, I had a blog every week. I would just theorize, you know, what I thought would, the episode was about, what, what was coming next. And, uh, and the blog was kind of popular, got really popular because I had been on a television show myself and there was a big fandom behind that show. Um, Gilmore Girls had actually just gone off the air, um, and, uh, and so the Gilmore Girls fans were, of course, coming to my blog to find out, like, oh, what's John Cabrera doing these days? And it turns out John Cabrera is, like, really, 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 really into the television show Lost. Um, and it was, and it, look, it wasn't because I thought that the show was great, certainly not by the standards that I had, you know, set for myself uh, over that past decade working in theater, trying to create great pieces of independent filmmaking, you know? It was the community that had formed around that show that had me so utterly engaged because it reminded me, I mean, I don't know if I realized it then, but I certainly do now, it reminded me so much of that feeling that I had as a kid in that house, bubbling with all that energy from those television sets. And crazy as it sounds, it was lost. Cheesy, melodramatic nighttime soap that made me realize that the community was the art, right? And if I was looking for greatness in art, I was really looking for greatness in community. Now, I keep using this word art, right? Mostly that's because that was the word that I was using for a very, very long time. Um, but really what we're talking about here, and certainly as it pertains to, I'm imagining, you know, the work that you guys are doing, uh, is story, right? So, if art and community are the same, then it would stand a reason that story and community are the same too, right? Okay, well, let's follow that notion for a little bit. Let's rewind the clock. Let's go back to the beginning of story, back to when there were no cities, when every human on earth was just roaming around, spending all day long trying to survive, right? It's part of our DNA, survival. Uh, and our particular brand of survival, right? Hunting and gathering, a defining part of the human experience, certainly at that time. Uh, so much so that at night, the urge is still there, right? From the moment we light that campfire until the moment that we fall asleep and probably dream of more survival, we're in this limbo state, right? No longer trying to survive, but still having that urge. And so what do we do? We tell stories, right? And in doing so, we feel safer we feel less alone. Why? Well, these were stories about our lives together, right? Working together. And those stories represented our community's most important daily activity, right? Survival. And so we begin to equate survival with community. They become intertwined. And so that same feeling we get working as a team to survive of safety in numbers, of not feeling so alone and vulnerable, we get that same sense of relief through story stories of survival, probably actual anecdotes of survival, like, hey man, remember that one time when the lion was chasing you and we all like, you know, kind of ran after it and got it away from you? Like actual things that happened to them, right? Um, 
In fact, those stories reflect the unique kind of active survival that we were engaged in, the kind of active survival that actually brought us to that campfire. I mean, we weren't cows, we weren't grazing on the grass, we weren't the lion sleeping all day and then, you know, pouncing. We were searching, right? Is that plant edible, right? Is that moose over there, or do you think we can get it, you know? Is this area here good enough to set up our camp? Are there predators around, right? We were explorers. Exploration is our greatest tool for survival, right? It's in our DNA to explore. And of course, we've always done it together. It's important that we do because we do it better together, right? And of course, those numbers make us feel safer, less alone. So stories and community, they seem to be bound together. They are, in a sense, the same thing, just as that day of survival from which stories are inspired is also bound to community, and of course both bound through exploration. And that is the key, right? That's what I realized through my obsession with Lost, and that's what I realized about myself during those years working in theater and film, and even those days back in that house with all those TVs, right? That we have a deep need for community, and it can be fictional, it can be real, just so long as we can explore with it, right? Because in doing so, we feel safe. And that, that is valuable. So, how does a story provide the opportunity to explore, right? What makes it so similar to those early days of survival? Well, the most obvious is the landscape itself, right? The world of the story. I call it the story world. Some people call it the mythology. Some people call it the expanded universe. Now, mind you, I'm not talking about, you know, the story itself, right? This is, this is where the story is actually told. In fact, the richer and the more nuanced and realistic your story world is, the more stories can be told there and the more opportunity and potential for your community to explore it. Um, to see this in action, all we got to do is look at some of the biggest story worlds out there, right? Their communities are massive. The Star Wars universe, right? Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. If you want to understand why video games have taken such a huge bite out of film and television viewership, all you, all you got to do is look at the huge worlds that they're creating for people to actually explore, right? Their promise of hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of exploring, not just exploring, but exploring in these huge online communities. And yet, a show like Game of Thrones, you think that it loses much of its viewership to gaming? Of course not right? Because it's a huge world, dense, it lights the imagination, right? It provides a similar opportunity to explore so many corners of that world, right? I mean, there are communities out there on the internet where you can actually learn how to speak Dothraki. You can, like, dive into the rich history of Westeros. I mean, these are powerful universes, right? Star Wars, Marvel. On TV, you have Lost, you have The Walking Dead. You know, they're just so much more than an actual story, now, maybe some of you guys are thinking, wait a second, that sounds like you're talking about science fiction fantasy, right? And maybe that doesn't apply to you because maybe you don't create science fiction or even like science fiction. Well, if that's the case, consider a show like, well, Gilmore Girls, right? And the idyllic town of Stars Hollow with its rich traditions, its countless nooks and crannies, its local markets, its town halls, its candy stores, right? When the Gilmore Girls community talks about watching their favorite show, they don't just think of it as a show. It's about returning to Stars Hollow, exploring that very detailed landscape together, right? And spending time, of course, with their family there because the world of the characters, that's also an extension of the story world and it's just as explorable. And science fiction certainly doesn't hold a monopoly on that, right? In fact, the daytime soap opera is probably the best example of the addictive power of the complex landscapes of characters. Love triangles, betrayal, who's connected to who and in what way. Communities love to explore the world of the characters and it's why there's usually a fair share of soap opera in pretty much every major show out there, right? For example, we have a show like Game of Thrones. We have a show like Gilmore Girls that at first may seem like, you know, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. And yet the two shows actually share a huge number of fans. Why is that? Well, because they are more similar than you might think. Dozens of interrelated characters with rich histories, right, that influence how they're going to interact with one another. 
We love exploring that, and of course, we love exploring that with others. Or how about themes, issues, right? Things that we're dealing with in our own lives, the very real story world that, you know, that we actually live in. We love stories that allow us to explore those big ideas too. And I think if there's any reason why science fiction and fantasy seem to have the largest fandoms, it's actually because speculative fiction allows creators to ask those big thematic questions in ways that are totally unique, that feel new and are therefore highly explorable. Current events that shape our modern world, relatable institutions put in a totally new light. Battlestar Galactica giving audiences the opportunity to explore the idea of military occupation in a very unique way, right? Harry Potter exploring the education system. Exploration is key to the greatness of contents, pure and simple, um, because the more explorable you make that content through its story world, through its character world, through its themes, the more enticing it becomes for communities to converge around it and do what they do best, explore. And so here is the good news. I said that there was some good news coming, right? Your content is not worth much. It just really isn't. But your community is. It's worth a lot. Um, your community will invest in your content as long as you give them avenues to explore. Content is no longer king. It might never have been king. Community is king. Um, we see it in the so-called YouTube generation, social media stars racking up millions of views on their content, collaborations between social media stars, growing those communities even more. That is the art. The content is in the art. The engagement across a variety of content, that's the art. The community, that's the art. How many people here are into Harry Potter? I've been talking about it a lot. Right? Show of hands. Yeah, of course, right? Um, so Harry, Harry Potter. Harry Potter, good example. Um, now, those movies, they made a lot of money, right? So it'd be pretty hard for me to argue that that content isn't worth much. Uh, I mean, just as movie, movies alone, they made billions of dollars. But every year that passes, those films are worth less and less. I mean, we can watch most of them for free right now. Even if you don't pirate your content, you probably know somebody that has the DVDs that'll let you watch them, right? But with every year that those films become less valuable, the community is becoming more valuable. Here's an example. I was just at the Harry Potter theme park in, uh, in LA, and I watched hundreds of people filing into the wand store. So they, they, I don't know if you know about this, but, but the Harry Potter theme park is just like a, an exact spitting image, ultra realistic model of Hogsmeade. Exactly the same, like with the alleyways, the train coming out of the wall, all of the stores, everything. And it was a ride, kind of, I guess a kind of a ride. I mean, it had the line, you know, the zigzag line, you know, hundreds of people filing in to the store, ultra realistic with all these wands up the wall that you could choose and put down 50 bucks to get. But here's the interesting thing. In addition to the $50, you were also paying for admission into the park, which was this highly realistic uh, version of a Hogsmeade. And as soon as you walked out of the store, your wand has a little radio receiver at the end. And you could walk through the different alleyways of Hogsmeade and you could use your wand, at, like use it at the store windows and inside things would happen. Things would start floating around. You would find things in there. It was this entire interactive, immersive experience. Like the entire theme park was the ride. How many people here heard that story and are like, I want to go to that? Exactly, right? So, how do you capture that in your content? Well, first of all, you have to stop thinking of your content as content, and you've got to start thinking of it as a haven for community. In fact, think of it as an extension of community. Think of it as the community itself, with your lead characters, your Luke Skywalkers, your Jon Snows, your Lorelei Gilmores, as the leaders of your community. I'm sure many of you at some point um, have been asked this question. You certainly hear it all the time when you pitch. Uh, I'm sure you've asked it a few times. Uh, who's your audience? And I think that the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, if your characters are the stewards, are the leaders of your community, who do you imagine them leading the best? 
right? What age demographic, what are their interests? Are they bookworms like Rory on Gilmore or Sam on Game of Thrones? Uh, are they hopeless romantics? Are they fighters? Are they cynics? Who do you imagine exploring that world? Who do you imagine searching for other people to explore it with them? And of course, that brings us to the question, what is your story world? Because again, a story is not a story world. In a strong story world, you can tell countless stories with a variety of characters in a variety of mediums. So the better you know the landscape of your story world, the better your stories are going to be and the more explorable they'll be. I always like to say that if there is one thing that all of my favorite stories, TV shows, films, uh, books, if there's one thing they all have in common is they all have the ability to be mapped, literally. Like I would, I don't know about you, but I would love to buy a cartography book for Breaking Bad. Seriously, like, like give it a shot, right? Walt's house, uh, the high school, the car wash, Los Pollos Hermanos, the meth lab in the middle of nowhere, the meth lab underneath the, the warehouse, the Mexican drug lord's estate, the motels, Jesse's house, uh, the police station, Saul's office. I mean, that world feels so real. And that's because in a sense, it is real. Which means the first step of developing a rich explorable story world is accepting that your story world is real, right? Which means that it already exists and it's your job to explore what little there is at the very beginning of your process and illuminate the other areas um, that are at first very hard to see. The characters, their histories, the events, which is exactly what your community is going to do as soon as they dig into your content as well. In fact, I don't even think that you should think of your work as creation. I know this is going to sound a little weird to some of you, but I actually believe that creation isn't the, the best way to develop a world. Uh, creation to me is kind of like saying no to the exploration process. Um, creation is assuming that no, there, there isn't anything there. And if there is, I'm probably not going to find it. And if I do, it's probably not going to be very good. So I need to create something new that doesn't exist yet. Now, don't get me wrong, no can be very, very valuable at a certain point in the process. Eventually, you will need to create new avenues to address inherent problems in your work. But early in the process, mm -mm. exploration, illumination, right? This is the promise that you make to yourself and to your audience that, yeah, there is something there. And if I look hard enough, if I use the clues available to me, I am going to eventually see it. I'm sure some of you are thinking, okay, okay, so content. Content isn't valuable. Communities are valuable. Um, how do I find that community? If I build the story world, they will come? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe not en masse, but even the smallest community, just like the smallest kernel of an idea, can be built into something huge over time, just like a, just like a piece of content, right? In fact, we now live in an age where you can bring the audience into your development process. You can actually begin building a community around the story world before it's even been fully illuminated. How many folks here have used Kickstarter? Yeah, not many, but enough. You might assume that its greatest value is raising money for your project. Um, but in fact, I think that should be the least of your concerns. You shouldn't even worry about whether, you're gonna, your, whether your product's going to actually be funded. That's just icing on the cake. Create a Kickstarter just so you can start exploring the earliest bits of your story world with a community. You know, maybe it'll be a small community at first, but a community that's interested in knowing more, and eventually a community that will invest in the tools that you need to bring them more of that world for them to explore. But you also need to you know, nurture that community, keep them engaged, give them more to explore. I mean, that's how the Harry Potter community got as, as big as it is. And you need to reward them for exploring it. And what better way to reward engagement than giving away your content for free? Because after all, it's not really worth much anyway, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you have noticed, but there is a new trend happening uh, on the internet um, in this new era of content. I call it the expiring internet, as opposed to the archived internet that we've uh, grown so accustomed to. Uh, platforms like Snapchat, uh, as well as new tools available on Facebook and Twitter, are bringing back an immediacy to content. In a sense, they're kind of returning 
us to appointment television, uh, rewarding communities for their rapt attention, a complete affront to all that hype around binge watching and you know, putting everything out, out at once. Why? Well, communities certainly weren't talking about each and every twist of House of Cards the way that they were talking about the huge twists in Game of Thrones, right? The global community was like on fire with the Red Wedding. The expiring internet encourages community because if content is viewable for 24 hours and you miss it, then you're gonna have to pay for it one way or another, either through money or through your time to try and find it on a torrent. But if you care the way that communities do, you will watch it one way or the other and that's all that really matters because that's what makes your community valuable. And what about the Harry Potter theme park? You think that you can make something like that? You can make a promise to your community like that? Will you have to wait 20 years for your community to be big enough for something like that? Maybe not. Um, I was working with a group of Polish filmmakers um, last summer. They were working on this gritty little crime noir story world. Um, uh, and the first part of that story world is a digital series, a, a web series that takes place in a reimagined version of Warsaw, Poland. Um, and they actually shot it in Warsaw. So Warsaw is actually their story world. Um, technically, they actually have the architecture for a theme park for their, their story world. And here's the really interesting thing. The next part of their content strategy involves warehouse parties there in Warsaw that sort of incorporate the landscape of the world that they've depicted in the series. They're working with local musicians and artists to build an entire culture around music and fashion for this series. They're looking for ways to give their community, small as it might be there at the beginning, a variety of avenues for exploration. So what makes content successful? I don't know if we've answered that question, but as you start to think about how to build on these incredible stories that you guys have brought here to Melbourne, um, you know, started to sort of bring to life for the world, or the first bits of story world inspiration that you guys have for your next project, um, I want you to ask yourself this, how can I make my content even more of an opportunity for an audience to actively explore? How can I make it more of a haven for community? How can I inspire that bubbling chatter and engagement that makes us feel safe in numbers, that makes us feel less alone? Because I believe that that will be the truest measurement of success, and it's ongoing and ever-increasing value. That, that is a profitable and meaningful entertainment industry. Thanks a lot.